Welcome to Terrifying and Twisted. Do you want a brew? Alright, welcome back to Terrifying and Twisted, episode 24. Still going, nearly a year. How is everybody? We've been very busy. Very busy. Uh, we actually planned to record on Friday night, but as car ended up blowing up. That's uh, a nice little expense. So we had to tow that back, and I don't know about you, but it just seems like we always get his research done. It's just the recording bit that's the hard bit. It was so much easier in lockdown, wasn't it? Yeah. Even though we were still working, yeah. but it was just so much easier. Right. But be- we're not even popular people, but <laughs> we always seem to have visitors. Yeah, we and do. And if it ain't visitors, it's kids. Yeah. And if it ain't kids, it's dogs. And if it ain't dogs, it's his car. Yeah. There's always fucking something. Always fucking something. Um, don't forget as well, November's our busiest time of year. Yeah, we've got four birthdays in November, so. We're three down. Let's Last go. one. <laughs> yeah. Last one. And then Christmas round corner. Uh, I just want to say thanks for some more messages from people to his terrifying and twisted page. It's actually been really nice because we've got as loyal listeners that have listened from day one but the messages we've been getting lately i'm not sure which episode they've listened to that's got them hooked but we seem to be getting messages from so many different places yeah i think it's ace man. yeah i love it this morning got a new message from someone called callum in australia who says he absolutely loves us so shout out to callum well hey tv wise what have we been watching philip right I've got Close to Me on Channel 4, yep. which we watched. Um, I'd probably give it about a 6 out of 10, if that. Yay. Got Christopher Eccleston in. It was all right. We enjoyed it, but... Yeah. A bit like Angela Black. Yeah, because that seemed to have dragged out a bit, didn't it? Yeah. We still watched it. And obviously, it's that time of year for I'm a Celebrity. So we we've been it. watching I'm a Celebrity, watching people eat cows' assholes. Oh, that nose. Fuck me. Cow's fucking noses. She just opened the box and it were a full on nose, wasn't it, staring at her? Best thing is, me and Carl were going to have his tea. And yeah. I said, I'll wait till after we've watched this first. Can't eat while watching this trial. So, yeah, been watching that. And we've just finished Tiger King 2. Yeah, we were quite late. We were looking forward to it coming out, weren't we? But again, because we've been that busy, we haven't had time to jump into it. So, we've watched that for the last few days. We finished it. If anyone else has watched it, I'll be interested to hear whether you think he's going to get out or not. Um, be interested to hear anyone's opinion on it. And did Carol fucking Baskin get <laughs> rid of her husband? We still don't know. That bitch Carol Baskin. Yeah. He's just fucking crazy. He's Joe Exotic, isn't he? Yeah, and I also want to say, if you've got any recommendations for us, please send them. Yeah, I tell you what I am looking forward to watching, which I've noticed you've put on Planner, is the murder documentaries. Is it on Channel 4? I'm not sure. Is it called Strangers? Something. There's three episodes, um, and I came across a news article on Facebook about it, so I went on to record it, but you'd already done it. So I'm looking forward to watching them. Um, also, on his watch list on Amazon Prime... If anyone remembers back to episode 14, I did the strip search scam. scam. And if you go on Amazon Prime, there's a film that's based on it called Compliance. Yep. So if you're interested in that, give that a watch. So apart from that, thanks for all your messages. Keep them coming because we we, we we, do love it. We are still here. It's just sometimes we struggle to record. We've always said from day dot, and you're probably sick of hearing it, we are what we are. We... We don't pre-record, we don't... We're a window cleaner and a carer. Yeah. Yeah. From from Ponte. Yeah. That loves true crime. Yeah. So, anyway, I'm really excited about my case. And I'm not going to lie to you, I'm excited for you to hear it because you know nothing. I know nothing. Which, to say how big it's been this month, 
all over, I'm really surprised, right? I just try and keep out of current events. You, you say that. I don't, See, know, I don't know why. I just try and keep out of current stuff. Whereas I've been following quite a few trials. Like, I didn't even follow the whole Brian Laundry thing. No, you didn't, did you? I just, as soon as Bounty Hunter got involved in that, I just stopped reading shit. <laughs> but he's been found dead anyway, hasn't he? Uh, but yeah, this has been everywhere. So, what I'm going to do is this is a case that I actually started researching a few months ago, and it was one that I'd kept sort of, if I ever got stuck. To the side. Yeah. So I'd done this research, and when I started this case, it was classed as unsolved. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to have to do it in two parts. This case is called The Bedsit Murders. It's 1987, and 25-year-old Wendy Dunnell, um, she lived in Tunbridge Wells, Kent. She was a shop manager at a Super Snaps on Camden Road. Everyone described her as being attractive and bubbly. She was in a relationship with her boyfriend, Ian Plass, who was a bus driver. Now, their relationship was quite serious, but they still didn't live together. Wendy lived in a basement bedsit at the end of Guildford Road. So, on the 22nd of June, 1987, Ian and Wendy had spent the evening together. They'd been out and about on Ian's motorbike. Around midnight, Ian dropped her off at home, watched her get in the house, and then he drove off. The next morning, he got a phone call from somebody that worked with Wendy asking if he'd seen her because she didn't turn up for work. Everybody knew straight away that were really unlike her. So, Ian went round to the bedsit to check. When he got there, he found Wendy dead in her bed. She had been savagely battered, strangled to death. She had also brutally been raped and was left lying naked, covered in blood. So, launching a massive police investigation, they started making door-to-door inquiries whilst a search started of crime scene. After looking into Wendy's background, the police could find absolutely nothing that would give any reason for anybody to want to hurt her. First of all, they're looking to the spouse, don't they, as usual? Yeah. Now, Ian was cleared straight away as a suspect. So... <clears throat> Did he have an alibi or something? Yeah. He were out of it. He explained everything. He dropped her off about midnight. He watched her go in. The door was closed behind her before he drove off on his bike. Right. Right. So she had no secret admirers, no em- enemies. She was really popular and well-liked. There were no clear signs of any forced entry. And nobody had heard anything. So the detectives came to the conclusion that the killer must have got in via a rear window, um, which latch were broken, and he must whoever this person was, were waiting for her. Forensics did find traces of semen on her body, which led them to recover a partial DNA profile of the killer. But all leads led to dead ends. At this point, whoever this DNA belonged to, just that. one on the yeah, system. Yeah. This case starts going a bit cold. They've got nothing to sort of go off. And then five months later, 20-year-old Caroline Pierce was the victim of a very similar murder. Caroline, like Wendy, worked on Cam- Camden Road as a shop assistant. She also lived alone in a bedsit, just one mile away from where Wendy's was. There was no evidence that the women knew each other at all, they just worked on the same street. On the 24th of November 1987, Caroline had been on a night out with her friends. She got a taxi back to her bedsit on Groves the Park about midnight. As the taxi drove away, Caroline was attacked outside. She managed to scream once before she was then abducted. Neighbours had heard her screaming, but when they looked, they didn't see anything. So when Caroline failed to turn up for work the next day, her family then reported her missing. Immediately, the police thought of Wendy and alarm bells started ringing. December 15th, three weeks after Caroline was reported missing, a farmer 40 miles away discovered a decomposing body in a drainage ditch. So like Wendy, she had been beaten to death, strangled and savagely raped. It was clear that she had been there for some time. The clothes that she was wearing on the night she went missing have never been found. Again, the police launched a massive investigation, but just like Wendy's, 
there was absolutely nothing that led them to any sort of strong leads. Right, so she were naked. Yeah. <clears throat> so the first victim yep. was murdered in her home. Yes. The second victim was kidnapped. Yeah. Taken who knows where. Yeah. Done God knows what. Mm-hmm. And then dumped in a drainage ditch. Mm-hmm. That, to me, says they are not planned. So, do you mean opportunist? Yeah. You've That's what I think, anyway. Because one has done it in the house and the other one is actually kidnapped. So, they're, like, completely different. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but what I will say is there had been reports of a prowler. Right. But nothing ever come of that. It'd been seen maybe twice Um Nobody could give a description, so police sort of were like, it could be not linked. The police, anyway, were convinced that the same person were responsible for both murders. They officially linked him via semen samples. Yeah, via DNA. Yeah, and the investigation continued. But unfortunately, after all possible leads led to a dead end, it was just scaled back. Now, it has never actually officially been closed... Both cases have been reopened on two separate occasions and they've both appeared on Crime Watch as well, which led to loads and loads of calls but never led to anything solid. As it stood, this case was unsolved for 34 years. So like I said, I did that research and then I was scrolling through Facebook and I came across a breaking news. This news article was about a man called David Fuller and he was 67 years old. So, like I said earlier, a DNA sample was collected from Wendy. After it had been tested a few times and never matched, it was still stored. So, in 2019, a reinvestigation was boosted by an enhanced sample from Caroline's tights. Checks on the national database showed a very close match that linked them to 90 people, which they then were able to whittle down and they eventually found a relative of David Fuller's, which then led them to him. Kind of like the Golden Gate killer, isn't it? Yeah. So, this is this is going to take a turn. Fuck me. So, when the first went to see him, he denied knowing any, you know, don't know him, never seen these women. Um, but eventually, on the 1st of December 2020, he was arrested. He was made to give a DNA sample, and obviously, it matched. His fingerprint was also a match to one that was found on a carrier bag at Wendy's bedsit. So they basically had him over a barrel. It was then, during a search of his home in Heathfield, East Sussex, that detectives found some hidden computer hard drives, some CDs and floppy disks with more than 14 million images of sexual offences. Dirty bastard. David Fuller had worked in hospitals and this footage included him sexually assaulting dead bodies in the morgue. Wow. Now, this took place in, it's now closed, but it was the Kent and Sussex Hospital. Once that closed, David then transferred to the new Tunbridge Wells Hospital in 2011. Our drives were found attached to the to the back of a chest of drawers, along with handwritten diaries. In these diaries, David had kept details of all his victims from the hospital morgue. That's nice of him, isn't it? It's lovely. Yeah. Here's a detailed description for you, mate. Who ranged from a nine-year-old girl to a 100-year-old woman. Fucking hell. Yep. So he ain't got a type? Definitely not. Sick bastard. This man... It remi- Sorry, it reminds me of Kill Bill. Yeah. When uh, fucking Buck's having sex with people in coma with Vaseline. Anyway. <laughs> Swiftly moving on. So, not only would David sexually assault these people, these bodies, he would keep a log of their ticket number... So basically the Ryan D number. He would then come home and he has admitted searching on Facebook for that person and finding out what they're like. He initially denied the murder charges, but on the 4th of November, he changed his plea to guilty. When he was assessed, he was asked if he kept the pictures for future sexual gratification. 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 That's what, you, that's what you'd think, the little trophies. Well, of course they are. Yeah. That's how... We've watched enough things, haven't we? 
that would point to it. But he actually said no. He didn't know why he did what he did. Talking shit. He's never... He's, I'm saying never. This, uh, this is very recent. So he's not given an ex- explanation of why he did it, what, yeah. what reason behind it, nothing. But one thing he did say is that these offences only ever took place in the hospital and not beyond... So he never hurt anybody outside the hospital, but he admitted to everything that he... Well, the hospital was his access, wasn't it? Right, so I then had a look at, well, how did he get a fucking way with it? And because he worked as a maintenance supervisor, he was an electrician, he obviously needed an access all areas card. Mm -hmm. And for him to be in the morgue wouldn't really be that unusual because he would change light bulbs, he would fix freezers, he would do all sorts of whatever. As well as banging dead bodies. Oh, Phil. Most staff would leave the morgue at 4pm. And because David's shift didn't finish till 7, he used this three-hour gap to do what he did. He would be in the morgue raping a dead body and there were times when porters had walked in and brought in a new dead body. But he were never seen because of the way in which the morgue were laid out. Right. It's also said that he used there knowing that it is hospital practice not to have CCTV in that room as a way of preserving dignity to people. So the images found by detectives, they actually only go as far back as 2008. But he had worked at the hospital since 1989. So they're under no illusion that there isn't so many fucking more. Yeah. Over 150 specialist family liaison officers have been tasked with visiting the victims' families from Ken, Sussex and Essex. And so far, 78 victims have been identified from these videos and things. His trial began at the start of November this year and he's admitted to 32 charges of sexually assaulting dead bodies, taking indecent photos of a child possessing extreme pornographic images and voyeurism. Is it voyeurism? After the judge decided to lift a reporting ban, Fuller, who is married with a son, can now be named one of Britain's most prolific sex offenders. And how shit for his fucking family. And his trial is still ongoing. How shit for his fucking family. Extremely shit. Your, d- your dad's a fucking necrophiliac. Yeah. Wow. See, it, see, it's really complex as well, isn't it? Because is there not ten different types? Oh, I'm not going through all that shit again. No, I well, know. I don't need you to go through it. But I am saying there is like ten different yeah. types, isn't there? Yeah. So, well, yeah, that's David David Fuller that's currently still on trial. and. Well, I'm assuming he's going to be getting charged with murder. Yeah, the two murders as well. Yeah. Yeah, but he's only admitted to 34... He's chatting shit about that no gratification. Absolute bullshit. There's no reason to keep it, is there? Because his motive in the first place was sexually... All sex... Yeah, sexually driven. Right, and I'm assuming after so long he didn't work at the hospital. So if he didn't work at the hospital, he's got no access. And maybe back in 1987 it were a lot safer to go and attack someone... As opposed to now where there's so much CCTV, DNA and all sorts. So instead, what you've got is his little fucking boxer sitcom. No, you're right. Yeah, he's chatting shit. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I agree he's chatting shit like. So um, my case this this time is a recommendation from... Rachel. Rachel in Worcester. I think it is. Yeah, I think she said so, yeah. Like Worcester sauce. (laughs) Yeah. So, shout out to you. Thanks for this case. Uh, This case is about a piece of shit called Susan Smith. Oh, a lady. Now, this Susan Smith, she was... I have actually got an auntie called Susan Smith, you know, as well. Sorry, Auntie Sue. (laughs) (laughs) Susan Smith, at one time, she was like the most hated fucking woman in America. Right, okay. So, Susan is the child of Father Harry and Mum Linda. She was born Susan Lee Vaughan in September 26th in Union, South Carolina. She had a bit of a troubled upbringing. Her father Harry and Linda had, they had a violent relationship 
very much drink. Okay. Surrounding drink. And eventually, her mum and dad divorced. Side note, her father was depressed and tried to take his own life five weeks after the divorce. Now, another man comes into the picture called Bev. Beverly. I ain't got his last name. I don't know why. And it's alleged that this stepfather, Bev, sexually abuses Susan. There's apparently a story where they're laid on the sofa and she goes up, cuddles up with him. And when she wakes up, he's touching her up. Yeah, okay. Um, following a fight at the home where Harry and Linda are arguing, um, Harry hits Linda while Susan is six years old and he attempts suicide and he dies in surgery. Okay. So we fast forward to later life of Susan. She's a 23-year-old single mother of two. She got married to a bloke called David Smith hence Susan Smith, and they married when Susan was 20 and when David was 21. They met at a local store, I think they were both working there. They have a back and forth, on and off marriage, a lot of arguments, a lot of um, a lot of shit. <laughs> so at this point, Michael is five months old and David and Susan are separated, but obviously still on and off. <clears throat> still banging each other. Yeah. We fast forward to November 92 and she's pregnant, trying to make a marriage work. And in August 93, the second son, Alex, is born. Um, I think they try and work out some sort of grown-up um, decision and the co-parent. Susan then gets a job as a secretary in a large textile mill and she begins seeing the owner's son, Tom Finley. I think Tom is married. Right. Or he's got a girlfriend or something like that. And they have this, you know, illicit affair. And in October 1994, Tom writes Susan a letter, breaking it off with her. He didn't want children. He didn't want to look after anybody else's children. There's also an alleged story that not only was Susan sleeping with Tom Finlay, she was sleeping with his father. Wow. Wow. She's having all that fun. <laughs> so, October 25th, 1994, she's obsessing over the whole fiasco, the whole Tom thing. I think she's very much driven to have a male's attention in her life. It clearly seems that way, doesn't it? Yeah. She cannot be alone by the sounds of it. So, this day, she went home ill and she picks up her kids from daycare. She met up with a friend to talk about it all. Said Tom didn't react how she thought he would after she'd allegedly slept with his dad. She asked her friend to watch her kids while she went to Tom's office to talk about everything. Okay. And Tom ends up booting her out. Allegedly, she tells her friend then, I may just end it. So at 8pm, she puts the boys in the car seats and she starts driving round. And she ends up at John D. Long Lake. Now, this car ends up in the lake. And the next thing, Susan's running to a nearby house saying that a black man... So she's not in it. Saying that a black man has took a car and the kids are still in the car. No, what she's done is she's got rid of her fucking kids so she hasn't got baggage because she wants this fucking bloke. So she phones the police, which is... Now, 9pm. Okay. The police arrive, and obviously these children are still in the car in this lake. Dead? Yeah. Drowned to death. So, which is one of my worst fucking fears. By second day of the investigation, the police suspected that she knew their location and hoped they were still alive, because they didn't actually have the car at this point. They just knew that that's the last place it was. Investigators start to search the nearby lakes and ponds, including John D. Long Lake, where their bodies were eventually found. Initial water searchers did not locate the car because the police believed it would be within 30 feet of the shore and did not search further out. Turns out it's 122 feet from the shore. Wow. After the boys had been missing for two days, Smith and David were subjected to a polygraph test. The biggest breakthrough of the case was a description of the carjacking location. 
She had claimed that a traffic light had turned red, causing her to stop in an otherwise empty road. Yeah. However, it was determined that the light would not have turned red for her unless a vehicle was present on the intersecting road. Right, which means that... This conflicted with her statement that she did not see any other cars. Yeah, no no witnesses. Yeah. So, it said she stopped off at John D. Long Lake in Union County and contemplated taking her life, but ended up choosing her boys instead. Smith pulled up to a boat ramp, put the car in neutral, hopped outside and watched as the lake swallowed her two children. The boys were still strapped in their car seats and completely conscious when their family car turned into a watery coffin. Fucking hell. When divers later pulled the car from the muck, a sodden teddy bear came out along with the two boys' bloated corpses. It was said Smith decided to kill the boys because a boyfriend who recently dumped her wasn't prepared for a ready-made family. But to this day, Smith still claims she doesn't know why she did it. She wasn't in the right frame of mind and she adored her kids. So, the trial. In 1995, David Brooke and Judy Clark served as co-counsel for Susan Smith. In their opening statement, Clark argued Smith was deeply troubled and suffered from severe depression. Clark told the jury, this is not a case about evil, this is a case about despair and sadness. The defence's theory of the case was that Smith drove to the edge of the lake to kill herself and her two sons, but her body willed itself out of the car. But she went to the... No! Chatting shit! No! The prosecution, on the other hand, believes she had murdered her sons in order to start a new life with yeah, a former Yeah, so do mother. I. So do I. It only took the jury two and a half hours to convict her of murdering them. During the penalty phase, Tommy Pope, the lead prosecutor in the Smith case, argued passionately in favour of sentencing Smith to death. The jury ultimately voted against imposing a death penalty and Smith's defence psychiatrist, Diagnosed her with dependent personality disorder and major depression. I do agree she has got the de- the dependent personality disorder. It's like she craves being with somebody. Yeah. That might be from a childhood, it might be from... You've no idea, but still don't go fucking kill your kids. The mum finally confessed to the crime when her story fell apart and was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility mm. of parole after 30 years which will come in November 2024. But the convicted killer faces a steep battle in convincing a parole board to set her free. A few years into her sentence, Susan was caught romping with two prison officials, a corrections officer and a prison captain. Fuck me, that woman. During the fallout of these incidents, the director of the Department of Corrections said she has always been a manipulative person. Wow. What I have got, just to end this, is her interview on the telly. Yeah, you'll hear her on TV. The most fucking hated woman in America. Prosecutors began this morning by taking the court back to the night of October 25th, when Susan Smith first reported her children had been taken by a carjacker. I'd like to say to whoever has my children... That they please, I mean, please bring them home. So not all the time. Not she only fucking... does she kill her fucking kids just to be with another bloke, she has the audacity to go on fucking TV. But as we always say in every episode, these motherfuckers exist. Ah, oh, I want to scream. But just think how angry these people in America would have been. Oh, outraged. Absolutely fucking outraged. And she's going to be out in three years to live a life. Oh. When she killed a one-year-old and a three-year-old. It's fucking... Words don't even... Words don't even describe these cunts. Yeah, just... I know time and time again, it's not like we are shocked because this is why we do it. But I think so. We do it because we're shocked every fucking time. Yeah, yeah. I think if it ever got to a point where we weren't, then then we need to stop. (laughs) We need to fucking stop. We've sensitised the self to it. (laughs) Um, What a a bitch. As soon as... So, as soon as you got to the point of they'd had this divorce and she then was straight in with this other guy and his dad, I knew then that she was going to be a very, very dependent person. She yeah. needs somebody in her life, don't she? 
I, from sounds of it, she was very much hated on, like, the example of Jodie Arias. Yeah. People just fucking hated her. And but quite you, you, fucking quite right, right so. I was just about to say yeah. it's, it's not like it wasn't called for. <laughs> oh, before we go, I want to talk about your birthday present. Oh, yeah. That Miss Chester got you. Yeah. So it was Phil's birthday on seventeenth, and one of our good friends, Kerry, always buys Phil a gift, even when he says time. Don't bother. She's now learned and stopped buying you a card, though, aren't she? Yeah, because I'm not. One, I'm you... not one for cards. <sighs> we know. Just write it on my fucking Facebook. It's cheaper, <laughs> it's and people free. pay fucking free four quid for a piece of card that says happy birthday. In what is the fucking point? I really didn't mean to set you off. But anyway, is she still buys you a gift? Yeah. And this year she got you one of the cases, the case files that we got sent to his house. Yeah. And it looks proper fucking good, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. So we're gonna do a review on it. I think we're gonna do some some stories. Yeah. We'll do some um, stories on it as we go along and progress. But the stuff that's came that's coming it the. Police files, the photographs, yeah, I, the evidence. I didn't, I didn't expect it to be so full, but yeah, they as do in provide detail. you with quite a lot. And you've got to use internet as well, haven't you? Yeah. Um, to get down to your suspects and stuff. It looks really good, so we're going to try. Well, put it this way, me and Carla do escape rooms, and <laughs> so far as record is... Shit! Zero. <laughs> Oh, but that's just me and you. <laughs> that is me and you doing trying to solve this case. Your problem is that you you just get fucking annoyed. I'll never forget that first escape room we did, and the woman was watching on camera, and you just sat on bed. Well, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not fucking doing it because, because we've run out of time. Yeah, and not only that, I was pulling up bits of carpet that she told to be you. Yeah, up. she told you not to pull stuff up. <laughs> You're trying to take fucking frames off wall and carpet. And just on a side note, the last one we did was a fucking scary one, right? <laughs> and for the first half an hour, I thought it was funny. But then <laughs> second half an hour, I fucking shit a brick. You go- I, w- I wouldn't even move. <laughs> no. I, I, I firmly had my feet planted. I'm not moving until fair- it's finished. I don't, I don't care about getting out. <laughs> we would have won that we got to the final part and you had to crawl down the narrow thing and straight away you went fucking yeah, no this little compartment opened and they wanted me to crawl through it and i was like fuck that and they told us at the end <laughs> that as you're crawling through it the actor crawls through after you he'd have got a fucking size 11 to the face Oh, we, first one we'd have got out of them. <laughs> it was funny. Oh, would you like the live actor or not? Oh yeah, fuck it, let's do it. Yeah. Nah. So, I'm still, I'm still trying to get girls to come do that with me. <laughs> I'm st- I still try and get Kerry and Lauren to come, but there's no chance. I don't think. So we shall see you on episode twenty-five, fuckers. See you soon. Bye.